Bacon are pleased to be hosting our sixth synth event on building with natural materials, focusing this time on stone. So we've got some great minds from across industry presenting tonight, followed by a panel session where the speakers will be able to answer your questions posted on the chat box. So I'd like to introduce Marcus Payne. Marcus is a fifth generation quarrier. He will share his insights into the history of stone and heritage, exploring various extraction methods. Steve Webb from Webb Yates Engineer will explain the material properties and sustainability. Then Pierre Bidot from the Stone Masonry Company will take us on a journey through the use of stone and strengthening systems. And finally, Amin Taha from Group Work Architects will share his experience of building with stone. Before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN, but for the benefit of others in the room, I'll give you a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. So for anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Formed in April 2019, it has now grown into a global network of over 3000 people. It started as a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more details about this in here on, on the ACAN website. ACAN is made of nine main thematic groups of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make change happen and a few people from each group take on a coordination role to help facilitate the group and any actions. You can hear more about what else is going on in the other groups by joining ACAN, and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box. I'll hand over now to Anna to introduce the speakers. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. So um, as Aurora explained, we've got four guests, and uh, the first up is Marcus Payne, if you could... Uh, show your screen that will be great while I introduce you. Um, Marcus is the second son of a Purbeck limestone quarrier with the family link to quarrying from County Durham through to Purbeck stretching back five generations. Marcus came to the Scottish borders and started Hutton Stone in 1994 cutting masonry and building stone in a disused barn. The company dealt initially in reclaimed stone and brought slab from other suppliers and in 1999 reopened Swinton Quarry which historically supplied masonry throughout the borders north Northumberland and also into Edinburgh. The company now operates three exclusive quarries and stock and stocks are further 20 um, other UK stone types. They have a purpose-built production yard and factories in both the Scottish borders and North Northumberland supplying large and small new build and restoration projects throughout the whole of the UK. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks very much, Anna. So uh, many thanks for having me along for this brief overview. And so let's take a quick look then. So bearing in mind, this is just a 10 minute whistle stop run through the subject in broad terms. I should firstly simply point out that right from this very start, we humans have picked up pieces of stone and successfully used them for building things. And as Scotland here beautifully demonstrates, our particular island is the result of as diverse a set of geological circumstances as exist anywhere on Earth, which, along with the other variations being true elsewhere in the world, has significantly affected and influenced how humans in any particular place have practically used the material at their immediate disposal. And this, again, in the UK as an example, should you look on any UK brick pit map, resulted in an incredible and vast array of historic quarries, pits, mines and extraction sites across the whole of the country, providing us with the vast and varied built history that by and large surrounds us and defines our heritage. These in the UK and elsewhere were mechanised and further developed throughout the 18th and 19th centuries and adapted as other technologies came to the fore and only faltered and fell away from around the start of World War I until they were to a great degree, certainly in the UK, abandoned by the start of World War II as social, political and other needs changed 
in conjunction with cheap and plentiful energy, boosting the credentials of other materials. And that gives us a very potted history of the immensely varied buildings we can still see today, from humble to incredible iconic buildings, castles and monuments, now many hundreds of years old. And to note very much the sustainable and economical use of material almost always evident in the form of more elegant frontages and rubble elsewhere. There is the humorous but relevant historical statement that states, the further you get from the front door, the poorer it gets, which in actual fact is a simple reflection on the economical and sustainable use of the material that was dug and prepared and the need to use it appropriately, but is now an important note to the lesson of how to use this material in the future as the low embodied carbon material of cho choice. And also to note that historically, the material at hand more often than not dictated the architectural process employed in its building and hence the essence of the area or the district. Next, it is only fair to say that in order to make a natural material sustainable and economical, and up until let's say 150 or so years ago, tonal range, color, variation, etc., was largely ignored as the material at hand was used to fulfill its practical role. This slide showing carboniferous sandstone in Annick Castle was at the moment of extraction around 290 million years old. And hundreds of years later, with pointing maintained, it remains very reliably still here. When freshly worked though, it must be understood that it was all sorts of everything in terms of color. And in a reasonable amount of time thereafter, nature simply toned it down to what we see surrounding us today across the UK today. The point here is that to judge a natural product that is millions of years old on a brief speck of its lifetime, when it is temporarily sawn or dressed clean and arguably at its ugliest, makes no sense in an economical and sustainable future. These houses, new, fresh split, purposely rejecting nothing in terms of range and variation in a natural product that sells currently at prices starting from 50 to 60 pounds a square meter, should be judged by the well-informed with the allowance of seasoning and aging rather than looking at palm samples of new stone and trying to control the outcome of a natural process that rewards the patient recipient. Meanwhile, and here we have uh, as an example, looking at images of enormous sample panels of Portland limestone cited at their production facility, which are used to allow the chooser to select those stones within any bed or range that are not acceptable to their palate which is theoretically fine if cost or environment is of no consequence, and if energy to dig and work is endlessly plentiful and cheap. But bear this in mind. St Paul's Cathedral, as an obvious example, used every single bed of Portland stone from across the entire range within its construction for economic and sustainable reasons. And we all like and appreciate, presumably, that building and don't find the stone to be an issue. So why have we forgotten this basic understanding of this basic material and instead choose to sanitize its many features to our absolute detriment? Assuring only that stone has become ultra expensive and highly rejectable in its current use when historic use of it surrounding us everywhere tells us plainly how to use it in a low carbon economical future. So on then to a quick glance at quarries. Some managed to remain open throughout the diminishing of the industry as other products rose to the fore. And as stone has latterly found more popularity, albeit as a clean thin veneer on more modern buildings, then other quarries have reopened. A small fraction of what previously existed, but all with long proven track records. And in Europe, it should be noted, 
that where we chose to continually develop our taste for man-made options, the French in particular chose to revert back to using low-cost natural stone as the basic load-bearing material to great effect decades ago. Here, this picture shows open cast quarrying, uh, working the available beds in the geology, which higher up generally provides walling quality material, whilst deeper down, larger blocks suitable for masonry. This is a nod to history and sustainable material use. If you dig it, use it. Hence, ashlar facades and rubble gables and rear elevations. It is all endlessly explained to us everywhere we look. Drilling, hydraulic or powder splitting of block. This image uh, in the, on the left-hand side showing a block of circa 120 tonnes before splitting again into workable sizes. Working with natural jointing, removing blocks for maximum yield in any natural geology and project unit size that works around the most efficient use of the material, the key, always the key driver to our industry. Where geology and jointing make it favourable to extract directly from the face via sawing, as in this polycore French limestone quarry, and many of the larger sites around the UK are too, and the world, then larger unit sizes become increasingly viable. Controlled splitting and techniques handed down the trade within all geology versions of extraction are not lost within this industry. It's just that they have not been required for a period, whilst the whole cost of making man-made stone equivalents has become irrelevant. Mines too. This one digging Portland limestone are as developed and sustainable as technology will currently allow. Sawing clean base bed directly from the face, but also a host of other beds that are instantly and economically relevant if we accept the perfect imperfection of the natural material. Thereafter, blocks are selected for suitability and run through production facilities, producing bespoke and mass produced products as required. With new ideas based on long since known historical demonstration and a now increasingly urgent need to reduce carbon footprint, allowing a growing group of progressive architects, designers, engineers, builders and clients to develop exciting routes forward. Companies with large stocks and extensive production facilities exist throughout the wider industry, as well as smaller companies more able to focus on smaller projects. Primary block sawing. Think of it like taking an uncut of loaf of bread from the bakers and making it into a sliced loaf. Thereafter, secondary finish sawing. In this right hand image, massive sawn blocks being hewed out so cut U-shaped out to sit 60 millimetres around a steel or concrete column. Why dig it and spend money on hollowing it out and throw 70% of it away? Why not just save yourself some high carbon materials and build it solid? Economical wire sawing, now including complex CNC options, a modern feature of the industry. Here aptly demonstrating how every block big or small, is used for its appropriate dimensions. No waste, always the fundamental industry target. Masonry, architectural features used sparingly but functionally to throw water away from the building. Surface dressings, often critical in heritage work, again can perhaps be used very selectively as a simple method of creating a front door definition to a building and architectural work as ever available to any requirement, though now more likely initially worked using CNC and tidied if needed by hand. All still possible. In essence then, and before I hand you over to my learned colleagues, who between them are demonstrating all of these things so well in the current market, this natural material demonstrates its abilities daily in our built history. But look far back and you understand its true purpose and future. View it once more as a basic building product, low in embodied carbon because the earth spent millions of years forming, forming it for us, full of character to be celebrated. 
designed with its characteristics as a guide in forming economical core sites and lengths. It is just a brick. It needs to return to being the cost effective one of choice for a sustainable future. Thanks very much for listening. Um, thanks, Marcus. I feel like we should do a round of applause for that one. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll move on now to Steve Webb from Webb Yates. We saw him recently, but um, Steve, I can't see you on the screen. But, oh, there you are. Um, is it all right if you um, start sharing your screen while I introduce you? That'd be great. Yeah. Um, Steve is a structural engineer and founded Webb Yates Engineers with Andy Yates in 2005. Steve has pioneered the practices approach to innovation and sustainability, encouraging the use of non-conventional materials from cast iron to cork and from inflatables to stone to design low carbon and environmentally conscious structures. In 2020, he was awarded the Milne Medal for continuously challenging and redefining what is considered possible in structural design. Steve also regularly lectures at universities and events, has taught at the AA, RCA and the Bartlett, has written for industry magazines, including BD and the ROBA Journal, and has judged various awards, including the ROBA and ISTRUCT E Prize. Don't know how you pronounce that one. Um, over to you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so, frames of reference. Um, when we're designing a building, I'm speaking as an engineer, uh, but probably speaking as anyone who's building a building, what are our frames of reference? Why are we choosing to build with the materials we're building with? Um, so, I guess point one on everyone's agenda is we don't really like buildings falling down or collapsing. We quite like them to stay up. Uh, I think People want to make buildings good value or affordable or quite often as cheaply as they possibly can. Uh, an emancipated structural engineer or engineer with a bit of latitude and, uh, and interest can make the structure really sing, make it part of the architecture and make it quite interesting. So that's something that we, we quite like to, uh, to do. Um, and then the next question is, what kind of employment do we create when we design a building or when we design a building structure. So are we making work for machines, blast furnaces, uh, sink smelters, or are we making work for people, for carpenters or for stonemasons? Um, what's the social consequence of the materials that we're choosing? I was really interested in the relationship between um, the cost of labor and the cost of material. And after the war, when there was a shortage of coal, material was relatively very expensive compared to labor. And there was a whole era of very refined shell structures. So people like Felix Candela working in Mexico, Eladio Dieste, Luigi Nervi here. Uh, it's a time when they could spend a lot of money designing and a lot of money making intricate form work because it was economical to do so because the material was so expensive. And I think within that is the question of taxation. So William Pitt the Younger decided to put income tax um, or put tax on income during the Napoleonic Wars to raise money for the coalition against um, Napoleon, immediately on the back of the window tax, just to say what, uh, what level of sophistication their fiscal uh, assessments were, making labor more expensive. And so materials are relatively untaxed, labor is taxed. So I'm always curious to think what would happen if you moved the fiscal burden from people to material, suddenly you would spend a lot more time working and making form work and complicated designs in order to save material and minimize the, uh, the cost of the material. Um, people are really excited about CNC and uh, it's a very liberating um, thing for designers, but uh, and we imagine that our, our future is going to be something like this with robotics, but actually maybe not. Maybe a lot of people who were doing those jobs before won't have anything to do and will be languishing on some kind of pitiful universal income. So these are all questions um, from buildings falling down to what kind of society we're we creating that are influenced by the way we build and materials that we choose to build with. So we think there's an imperative to take some kind of moral stance on what we're what we're designing with. And there are very um, embodied carbon is um, is a complicated subject, and there are lots of people intervening in the subject with very complex spreadsheets and systems and way of uh, ways of analyzing it. Um, I think it can be more visceral than that. If I see a sausage sandwich with melted butter streaming outside of it. I know it's calorific, 
And if I see a big building covered in concrete and, uh, and steel, I know that it's high carbon. And I think we could educate people to have a similar response. Um, my thought is normally if there's fire in the manufacturing, then obviously it's a high carbon bad material. If there isn't any fire in the manufacturing or limited fire in the manufacturing, then, then it's a better material. So you can see here, forests and quarries don't generally have huge plumes of smoke pouring out of them, whereas blast furnaces and zinc smelters and aluminium plants and cement works really, really do. What is the case of the stone? So we take stones, um, limestones and granites um, with strengths of, well, particularly limestone strengths up to 200 newtons. We crush it up, we get a load of gas, we burn it to make cement, we batch it with sharp sand and fresh water, both of which are in a state of shortage. We put up formwork, false work, reinforcement, releasing agent, back cropping, vibration. 28 days later, we strike it and we have a material concrete with the strength of about 40 newtons. So we've really thrown a whole kitchen cupboards worth of industrial processes at a material that was pretty strong in the first place and ends up pretty weak and inferior in the end. So you have to ask yourself in the middle of a climate crisis whether that really makes sense or not. What are the relative carbon footprints for um, the different materials use by use? So people would say, oh, steel's really high carbon, but actually it's very strong, so we use very little. So it's better to use little material. Uh, actually, this is a comparison. We have a one-ton car hanging from a beam spanning two meters across a gap. The top row are all sections of equal depth, 200 millimeters, that are strong enough to carry the car, car's weight. The second row are all sections that are comparatively stiff to one another. So most structural members are sized for their stiffness. Deflection is a preeminent concern in building more than strength, actually. And on the bottom row is the carbon footprint of each of those materials. So you can see that although a tiny slither of steel can support the car, it actually has 22 kilograms of carbon per meter compared to 14 for concrete, only five for timber or minus 16 if you count the sequestered carbon in the timber. So the sequestration of um, carbon in timber in buildings is always brought into question because A, the building can rot or burn down at the end of its life and so the carbon gets back out. Um, and actually, if you drive into a forest in a massive diesel truck and spark up a chainsaw, none of those processes are actually carbon negative, they're all burning fuels. Um, uh, you have to wait for the next tree on the plot to grow and swallow up carbon. So it happens over the ensuing 25 years. It's not an immediate carbon saving. On the very right-hand side, we have a post-tension stone beam. So a stone beam with a very thin reinforcement bar through the middle of it. It's capable of carrying that load at 22 millimeters by 200 mil. And it's only got a carbon footprint of 1.5 kilograms per meter. And the reason is that stone is much, much stronger than timber but requires a similar level of processing. So the stone is already in the ground. We take it out and we cut it up rather than like we take the tree trunk and cut it up. And uh, But but stone's a lot, lot stronger and a lot stiffer, so we use much, much less of it. People have said, uh, why is stone sustainable? So there's obviously a big push for biomaterials, understandably, um, and stone isn't a biomaterial. And people say, is it a replenishable resource? So I wanted to say, first of all, the volume of the earth and actually, when I was talking once, somebody said to me, what happens when all the stones run out? And I was envisioning a kind of cluster of uh, office buildings and, uh, and tower blocks floating around the sun in some kind of uh, Saturn's ring um, once we've consumed the entire planet to, to build with. Actually, if all 7 billion people on Earth had a 5 by 5 meter, 200 millimeter thick slab of stone, uh, it would be a whole 40 kilometers square by 20 meters deep. And when it was finished, you could fill it up with something else. So the volumes that we build with are absolutely tiny compared to the volumes that, uh, that are available. And if you if you really started digging into the stone, the new stone would very quickly bubble up in its place. In comparison to timber, so we're interested in the, um, in the land use of quarrying versus the land use of forestry. If, if I take a tree and I have one and a half cubic meters of usable timber in the tree, I can use 75% of it probably, and it has a strength of seven and a half newtons. So it's not very strong. So we made an imaginary unit, meter cube newtons per year. So that's how much material, how strong is it? And over what time period can you get it? So for a tree, you get 0.336 meter cube newtons per year. Underneath the tree, 
you potentially have 500 cubic meters of 150 Newton material that you can remove in three months. So the unit is 224,000 meter cube Newtons per year for the same size plot. So you get far more bang for your buck land use wise than uh, with quarrying for stone uh, than you do with trees. And uh, a lot of people are saying, oh, we can't stop building with concrete or steel because if we start quarrying, we'll have quarries all over the place. But actually all of those materials are quarried already. So steel and concrete, clay for bricks, everything that you already use comes out of the ground. The relative strengths of stone compared to concrete. So the, the unique advantage of stone over concrete is that it's much, much stronger in compression. So uh, a concrete with a compressive strength of 100 Newtons is very, very carbon intensive and quite exotic and difficult to, to build. Um, when concrete sets, it traps a lot of water in the cement matrix, and as it dries, it shrinks. And as you compress it, you squeeze the water out like uh, in a sponge. And so you get long-term creep movements in concrete buildings that tend to define the deflection um, the deflection behavior of, uh, of concrete elements and require them to be much bigger. You don't get that behavior with most stones. So stones are much, much stiffer. They have almost double the stiffness of, um, of most concretes and they don't have that long-term behavioral effect. And the third thing is that stone is much better in tension. So it has a much stronger uh, tensile resistance um, that we can use. So in, in European stone architecture, in the history of European stone architecture, generally speaking, you have anti-funicular structures, which means the opposite of a rope, uh, an arch. So you have arches and vaults and uh, piers and columns, um, always using stone in compression. Um, but in other cultures, and particularly in India, they're building tradiated structures. So they're building stone beams and stone slabs, and they're using stone as a tensile flexural material, which we haven't tended to use here but actually has quite a lot of potential so we started working with uh with pierre uh many years ago and um, we used to design traditional stone cantilever stairs with him but he could only sell staircases to people when there was a stair against the wall and um he was really excited about the prospect of uh post tensioning and being able to sell free spanning stone stairs so we started looking at other examples of post tensioning of stone uh and experimenting starting with very short small flights eventually um, arriving at this one which is a 270 degree helix each tread on the staircase is an individual block of stone it has two holes drilled through it and each hole has a 12 millimeter cable laced through that and those cables are pulled tight with 12 tons of, of pre-stress holding all the stones together uh, and we're able to create this very very thin very succinct uh, structural helical staircase. So we did a lot of design of these kinds of stairs for um, generally for rich people's houses. Um, uh, very simple ones like, like this. And I think we must have completed 60 or 100 of them all over the world by now. Um, and uh, I'm actually getting quite, quite versatile. So this one has a single cable down the middle of it with individually carved treads. Um, but actually, uh, it's not that interesting designing staircases for rich people's houses. What we're more interested in is interested in is changing um, changing the way that we build. And I mean, uh, I don't know whether I mean it's going to talk about his building, so I won't dwell on it too much. But um, it was really uh, the opportunity to make this building with low bearing stone was very interesting. So this building has a concrete frame on the inside, has a concrete core. Um, stone frame is built around the outside of it and takes all of the vertical load from the perimeter of the building down to the ground. So it's a fully structural facade. Um, you have great competition between subcontractors on building sites for hook, the hook of the crane or hook time on the crane. Uh, concrete contractors always need the hook because they're moving reinforcements and concrete and formwork and stuff like that around. So the stonemasons, and if the two are on site at the same time, they're going to be arguing about who gets the crane and there'll be a lot of claims of um, inefficient working. So what we decided to do was to build the frame on temporary propping, which is what you would generally do in a concrete slab, build the stone afterwards and remove the temporary propping afterwards. So it's a kind of reordering of the construction process only necessitated by the fact that the stone masonry company and the um, and the concrete company are two different people. Actually, if they were the same people, then it would be a far more straightforward, um, straightforward build process. I think Amin is going to talk about the um, the finishing and the origin of this, but I uh, 
I mean, to my mind, it's um, uh, it's a kind of it's a reasonable scale proof of concept of load bearing stone as if we needed any. It was surrounded by load bearing stone buildings from thousands uh, a thousand years ago. Um, but it's showing it in a modern context and can be built by modern contractors economically. But what we're really interested in doing is post-tensioning stone beams and columns. So a post-tensioned stone beam is a very simple um, structure. They're individual blocks of stone. We drill a hole through the middle. We pull a bar through it. We pull the bar tight, which jams the stones together, and we have a beam. Um, I, I think I can fit the plant required to make a beam like this in a suitcase, a saw, a drill, a post-tensioning jack, and a bit of cable. And I can go and make a beam that will be more or less the same size as a steel beam, have more or less the same strength, but only one fifteenth of the carbon footprint. So I can't make a steel beam without a blast furnace, for example. So it's quite a democratizing technology. People with poor balance of payments and countries without their own steel resources could actually make competent beams without uh, cement or steel. Um, we've been testing. Um, we have a R&D program with a budget of about £1.50. And uh, thanks to um, uh, Pierre and the Stone Masonry Company's generosity, we've been able to do a lot of testing um, connected to projects. So this is a stone um, uh, stone beam um, failure. So we tested this to failure with Wendell Sebastian from UCL, um, trying to work out how close to reality our, our analysis is. We were really worried that if we had a fire in a limestone building, we would end up with a little pile of cement afterwards at 700 degrees limestone turns into cement or lime uh, this was a fire test for a loaded beam for a project um, actually lasted for three hours and the reason is that in a concrete beam a the water inside the concrete turns to steam blows the face off the beam exposes the reinforcement which melts doesn't happen with um with this stone at least uh, and the post-tensioning cables are a long way inside the section so they're much better protected so they're very good fire resistance from this beam <laughs> Excuse me. We um so I've been trying out uh in various um uh situations. This is the, the new Stone Age exhibition at the building center where we made 12 meter span, 400 millimeters uh deep, 300 wide beams spanning 12 meters for commercial buildings. And more recently at the RA uh summer exhibition last summer, we made this one, which was recovered um granite from a demolished building where we're using using it at the points of high stress at the end anchorages in the middle where it has to be quite strong and in between um weaker uh, portland roach bed um both of which are uh were inexpensive stones um the idea that it's this kind of t-shape is mimicking a, a concrete beam um and this is uh, pierre and the stone masonry company's beam factory those beams are quite um uh, what would you say, affectational, um, the finishes for the architectural project they're involved in, actually, they can be really boring, straightforward beams, or they could be split beams. Um, uh, but you can see there's not very much plant there, and it's a relatively simple thing to, to build. Slabs, the same. Um, I was in Mallorca, and um, uh, Ibabi, the um, housing um, department of the local government, are building a lot of solid stone social housing. And they were saying that in Mallorca, there's stone everywhere and it's their traditional material. They want to get back to their traditional materials to decarbonize. And the guy said, everyone um, uh, should have, or every place should have its own architectural language that responds to, um, to where it is. So they have stone everywhere and they build in stone, which makes sense. And I started thinking in the UK to decarbonize, we're building with CLT, but um, massive pine forests like uh, Switzerland or Finland are not what we've got. We're actually importing this stuff. And it's not our, not really our language. So I was thinking, at, um, you know, what's a better solution for us? So we've been doing a lot of work with designing hybrid timber and concrete buildings where we put a very thin layer of concrete on a timber frame because the concrete's just heavy enough to take the heat out of the air to avoid air conditioning in many situations. So this is a composite, structurally composite timber and concrete frame structure in a 17 million pound office building. So uh, we think this is a great idea, but the concrete is obviously problematic because it has a very high carbon footprint. So you can see the exposed concrete in the soffit. Um, the next step is to, to try it with stone. So um, so this was a test project that we did in, in North London. So we, we try things on little jobs gradually um, graduate them from, from job size to job size. So this is the first of about five different composite timber and stone projects that we've been working on. Um, we have a post-tension stone beam across the back of the house. 
The back wall of the house is supported by a timber beam on stone columns. The stone beam sits on a wooden post. And in between the stone beam and the back of the house, we have timber joists and infill stone. So I think for a country like ours, where we have a little bit of wood and a little bit of stone, uh, not quite the southern tradition of building with stone and the northern European the Protestant tradition of building with timber, we're kind of floating in the middle. And this kind of typology, which is a mixture of timber and stone, can not only avoid air conditioning, it can be very low carbon, it uses the resources we've got quite effectively, and you can build anything with this. So these beams can do long spans with infill of timber and stone, and you can leave it exposed. And I think it's uh, potentially very interesting um, new typology for the ecology that we in the UK find ourselves in. And uh, that's the end. Thanks, Steve. That was uh, that was great. Um, you mentioned Pierre Bideau um, in your talk, and that's who we're having next. So, Pierre, if you want to get your slides ready, that would be great while I introduce you. Um, Pierre is the creative director at the Stonemasonry Company Limited. He trained as a journeyman in France in, U in the UK. In, has been in the UK for 20 years. His experience has been acquired in restoration work on site and shaping stone. However, Pierre got more and more interested in the integration of modern technology, um, as you've just seen with dimensional stone to widen its use. Um, advocating relentlessly for a use of stone as a structural material, he is also keen on bringing together architects, engineers, and craftspeople to increase collaboration for better building. Right, thank you very much, Anna, for, uh, for the introduction. Right. Okay. So um, I just want to get uh, uh, something across. Is as 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 Marcus explained, there is something that we haven't um, that we have forgotten in the last fifty to seventy years, and it is how the imperfection of stone has made our our building so beautiful. And I think that with uh, the energy crisis, the climate crisis, I think by default we should go back to stone with very much its default uh, also. And um, I, I think that what we are trying to, to prove with, um, with our system of, of uh, exoskeleton um, to, uh, um, to put back stone in, into load-bearing building is that um, the Triliton, which is a, a very well-proven system and which is, uh, of course, just um, two pieces of uh, stone, two columns and, and one beams, um, which of course um, is a start of any stone buildings. It, it's a it's a very simple um, vocabulary, you know, very simple elements that we are using, and um, we just want to go back to a, a much more easy and shall I say fun way to uh, to build. Um, it's just that if you look at this uh, lovely. Um, um, lovely work by William Blake, um, and we should never uh, miss the opportunity to put a William Blake illustration in a in a talk. Um, you, you can see the the, the sort of um, simplicity of, of that wall system, but also by that picture, something that um, Marcus tried to put uh, and, and put across is that how this material, any material that we extract, should be considered as as sacred. You know, it, it's just it takes a lot of energy to get out of the ground and, and just to see any any stone, any clay, any slate being wasted is, is something that is um, that 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 we shouldn't uh, we should do approve, we should not approve. And when you look at uh, on the left hand on the right hand side, this um, Algerian ruins uh, of um, in Algeria, ruins of a Roman um, uh, Roman temples. And, and you can see that so simple Triliton just still still being there, still standing up, um, ready in fact uh, to why not uh, welcome some some new infill panels and and maybe some beams to uh, to make a, a new housing. I, I think we should really um, look into uh, uh, what uh, I call um, and and I will put that across uh, in in, um, in 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 the talk what I call litosophy which is the, the wiseness of stone. And one of the wiseness of stone is that we should absolutely look at stone as a, as a commodity and not as a luxury. And um, if you look on, on this um, right and um, left-hand left side pictures, 
um, you can see these two massive pillars, two massive pillars of stone that has been just briefly, which has been pitched and you a bit and um, ready to, to be put into that uh, building, supporting six of the floor of um, uh, six of the floor up, uh, on top of those um, columns. And those columns are just going to be cladded in wood. Okay, that's in Lyon in 1850 uh, as, um, as, uh, as the ground floor of that, um, of those buildings. Um, they were not showing the stone. The stone was just a natural concrete that was going to be covered in wood um, or plaster. Um, and which, as I say, was just a pure uh, commodity. And on the right hand side, you can see again, 1815, Lyon being, um, having this new uh, Republic Avenue being put through. Um, and uh, all, those all those stones comes from 100 miles, uh, miles away, um, just brought on cart, put on a boat, then unloaded, then, uh, uh, then erected again on, on, on that new, uh, new, new Lyon. And um, at, at a rate that was uh, making it a very affordable material, uh, despite all the energy that, that was taken by the, uh, to extract it. And um, I, I think again, as, as Steve was saying about the, 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 the comparing material and, and how much energy they take uh, to, uh, to be extracted, to be shaped, um, this little um, illustration show, you know, how on the last, um, let's say 600 years, 900 years, we, we have just um, started to see stone disappearing little by little, especially in the last hundred years, when of course, um, still was going to be um, the, the material by, uh, by default because so easy to, uh, uh, so easy to, uh, to erect, um, so easy to specify also. Um, and um, this slow disappearance of, of stone is really something that we, we need to study um, and look how, based on those studies, uh, uh, how we can put it back into, um, into the, the, the architect vocabulary. Uh, when you see that in from 1990s onwards, we we've got this sort of ridiculous veneer that has been just put on put against uh, um, um, concrete, which, uh, as Steve has explained before, uh, needs so much energy to be to be transformed and to be put up uh, on on site. And um, I think uh, I will leave that to I mean to to talk about the, the sustainability criteria of stone. Um, but there is a huge case for stone as a, as a low low carbon material. You know, when you look at uh, this very rare illustration showing um, showing showing material um, uh, comparison, um, you can see that you nearly have three three times less of carbon um, in in the production of stone than, than concrete. Um, and I and I think uh, I mean we'll talk a bit more about that. And what for me what's what's very important is I, I i love anything to do with history um and uh, something that uh, was key on 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 the last uh, 10 years of development um with i mean steve and, and and others was um that nowadays i do believe there is a certain um how to put it um similarity in, in the co social context the economical context that we have in, in 2000, uh, in the 2000, and, and, and of course in, in 1950s uh, with France just after the war. Um, 1950s uh, in France, you had, um, you had a, a complete rebuild of uh, the housing stock to, to that, that was going to take place. And of course, as you can imagine in 1950s, one of the, um, one of the energy that was, uh, um, that, that was, the, the most uh, available was uh, coal. And um, it take a lot of energy to get coal. Um, in 1950s, between 1947 and 1950s, you had large uh, coal strikes uh, in France. Um, and um, to, produce, uh, to produce material to build with, um, you need a lot of coal. And the French government in 1950s decided to, um, to commission um, a, a report on, on the use of energy and the use of coal to produce different material. And to their great surprise, they just they realized that to do one cubic meters of concrete, you needed 225 kg of coal compared to just 10 kilo for uh, one cubic meters of stone. So um, in their great wiseness, once, 
the ones in the blue moon, the French government decided just to move to a stone industry um, and pivot to um, a completely uh, new uh, way of, of working stone, making it an extremely um, uh, um, efficient way of extracting stone um, and then supply it to a, to a local, uh, local project. And um, I think that uh, what, we, what we are doing now, um, more or less uh, nearly 70 years later, is that we've got exactly the same uh, the same context? Is that um, we 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 have an expensive um, energy, um, we've got uh, um, uh, labor so short labor labor skill shortage, um, like in 1950s France, um, and on top of it, as as a third argument, we've got of course the climate crisis and and the cost of low of uh, of carbon footprint, and um, and I think Stony is the perfect. Uh, um, uh, a perfect way to to uh, to change uh, to change that. Now, um, something um, I, I, something that you need to understand is that, as as Marcus was explaining, when you extract stone, um, you are going to extract it with heavy heavy uh, uh, heavy machine uh, that uh, cuts through them through the stone uh, through the the cliff. Uh, there might be uh, cab cables and and wires uh, that we called uh, that that are got some pieces of tungsten and, and, and industrial diamond um, stuck on it, and that's going to a grinder stone. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, on the right-hand side of the, um, uh, of, the, of the illustration, you can see some beautiful thin marks uh, done by the, by the wire. And those marks, as the, the mark done by the chenso at the quarry, in fact, uh, are, are mark of the modern tools, and as such should be left onto the stone to, uh, to again uh, make the stone a lot more affordable because the, the less um, human interaction you have with the, uh, with the material, the cheaper it's going to be. Um, you do not want to over-own uh, stone. You just want to leave, to leave it as raw and natural as, as possible. Um, and um, again, um, it can be done by, by this huge chainsaw machine, but it's, it can also be done um, here at a very much smaller, smaller scale, smaller scale for uh, for Amin's building, uh, just by hand. Uh, however, you would go into uh, uh, quarries all around Europe. Um, those um, those drilling and then splitting would be done uh, using um, uh, hydraulic machine um, and and to a much 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 faster speed. Now, um, when when um, when you look at uh, Clark and Well Close, uh, what's fascinating is to realize that uh, to extract uh, to extract the hundred cubic meters of stone um, from the quarry, you just needed for th you just needed three men for four months. Okay, so it's a, it's it was quite a short um, quite a short uh, span of time, and uh, after that to just uh, work out the connection. That was going to connect the um, uh, the stone uh, to the um, to the concrete flat slab. Uh, you just needed one man, um, and that was Regis, uh, who for uh, four months uh, worked out all the uh, all the placement of that connection box for those um, uh, for that um, steel connectors that's going to held uh, uh, the the concrete slab that uh, at Clark and Well, and. Um, and once those uh, those uh, connection box um, uh, rebates uh, were done, the stone was like any precast, uh, any concrete precast uh, system was going to be sent on site, as this as showed by uh, Steve before, and just put as any um, any man-made material. Um, and I think that that's the the beauty of it is that. We, we do not want to disrupt the, 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 the construction uh, industry. We just want to, to challenge the use of the, the material that the construction industry is using. Uh, because what we want to do is to bring as little as possible um, problem to the main contractor on site. Um, and uh, I, I think with that system, we just prove that uh, we can be as competitive as the, um, as the concrete cast, uh, at the precast industry. Um, and of course, a uh, lot of those uh, projects, you need to have a, a very tight team and dialogue between and the engineer and the makers and the architect, um, because um, it, it's like this intimacy that we lost with the material. We need to go back to a sort of much more closer team 
uh, not working in silos and 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 w work out a solution for each each of our problems um uh, so we've been, you know, very well known for those amazing structure we've done with with the help of uh, Steve uh, and its team, um, you know, from project in Turkey, project in Sweden, US, um, with three cable, two cable, one cable. Um, and of course, when we use that sort of technology, we just want to, to be as possible capitalizing on what we are learning. And what we learn is that for the project at Aminta, we we were we, we decided to source the stone um, in south of France in, in in near Lyon, and that stone was coming in in big um, in big uh, monolithic blocks. But uh, we thought that um, in quite a, quite a lot of limestone quarries uh, around the world, um, you have um, uh, quite a, a, a huge stock of unused stone. Okay, that has been what we called unloved or visually challenged. Um, and those stones, as Marcus explained, need to be reused. But the thing is, um, the best way to make to make best of use of it is, in fact, just to post-tension them or pre-tension as, as we are doing. So you can see on the left-hand side some very happy stone that has been discarded in the past um, and which are happily going to go back on our, to go on our rigs uh, to be put together and just make um, a beautiful planks, beam, um, or, or columns. And um, I think that, you know, with the very well-known technology of post-tensioning, pre-tensioning, um, a material like ours, which we've been knowing, which we've been working with for the last 6,000 years, um, you know, there is a huge potential of, um, of decarbonizing part of the of the construction um, and, and the build um, using natural stone. You can see on the left hand side again our uh, our rigs with uh, some stone planks at the rear um, on the other pictures some some of the columns that we are going to use. We, we just want to go to a sort of exoskeleton as we call it. Uh, sorry for the puns. Um, uh, an exoskeleton that um, would um, uh, would be done as as a um, as something that the, the that's the British industry li like very much with its columns and beams. Um, a lot of, of the project in France um, are done by large, thick supporting wall. But again, we, we just want to, to, to maybe um, make our structure a lot lighter than, than in France using less stone, a, a bit more engineered, um, but working on a, on, on a sort of structural system that will, um, uh, that will make the construction um, life, if you want, uh, a lot easier um, without not to have to learn again how to to set you know set stone one by stone one stone by one stone on site. Um, and I think that those prefabricated elements that we provide uh, will will be will be something that will make the 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 efficiency on site um, very very clear. Uh, here you can see uh, a, a project uh, that we are working on with the amazing stones of it uh, uh, just hanging uh, just um, uh, holding the the floor um, and some on some very very long beams up to eight meters the the splits of it uh, of the planks stone planks that you can see here are 11 meters long we can go up to 12 meters and um, many of those elements were all all prefab the, that is the system we are proposing now using uh, stone from Polycor, uh, stone from uh, Albion Stone um, in the UK, and of course, of course, Marcus, um, trying to work with those quarry to, to, so that we find an outlet uh, for the, uh, their own love stone um, and uh, to, to try to, to make a 100% uh, uh, use of their material so that you don't go from unselected material um, to, from selected material and then unselected material going straight to aggregates or, or just uh, doing um, something that, uh, that, that could be done by other material, like for example, uh, curbs or la landscaping. Um, I, I think those stone has got up to from 40 to 100 MPA and, and it's a bit absurd that this stone that have so many MPA, so, so incredible compression uh, should not be used um, in um, uh, it shouldn't be used in, in construction again. And again, on these pictures, you can see some of the polycore material, um, which wasn't selected. 
um, and that we um, we we have worked with um, with the quarry to just put back into the construction. Um, this is totally unselected material with different type of veins, of colors, of pitting, um, and you know you can only uh, embrace the the beauty of the imperfection. Um, so again, as Steve said, and I will uh, just uh, fly through that. Um, I, I just want to point out that uh, I, I find it very weird the, the way that engineer just test to death all our material. It's a torture chamber. If, if you are going to come to the workshop sometimes between burning, crushing, overloading. I mean, there, there, there should be a case against engineer uh, doing so much to our material. But uh, I know it's for the good of things. But yes, uh, a, a burning, burning stone is something that we uh, now uh, um, start to enjoy. Uh, especially seeing that they can stay up to three hours uh, under dynamic loads um, at 900 degrees uh, with very little spalling um, and some very good results because we just found out that it, those post-tension systems really behave like concrete. And again, uh, something that, um, that has been kickstarted uh, now 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, a renaissance of uh, of load bearing stone buildings all, all around France um, because uh, of new regulation, uh, the RE 2020, um, a certain amount of um, sustainable material need to be um, used for, uh, for new build. Um, and I think that uh, it's interesting to move from an, uh, an all wood structure to maybe a hybrid structure of stone and wood. Um, that would make a lot more sense. Um, and uh, those pictures, uh, in, a, in, a, in 70 years, you've got even a Fernand Pouillon uh, Porte de Pantin building on the left left hand corner, um, you know, as a sort of uh, uh, renaissance of uh, stones during austerity time, um, and to this lovely building made of uh, so many different limestone from, uh, from Europe. I, I think there is a big case for stone and you know, when you look at uh, this poster that uh, I, I did now two years ago, I think um, there is many, many uh, structural stone building on the way. There is even more now. Um, quarries are making a big effort in trying to to push their material to a much more affordable price. And um, I think those structure that I mean, uh, we'll talk now uh, in a few minutes. Uh, this amazing structure uh, that can be um, that can be producing uh, new technology. Um, like new technology, uh, new engineering, but with an old technology like pretensioning, um, I think there is a, a big case for stone. So uh, not forgetting, of course, um, that any stone building is a quarry to be, but uh, that would be my uh, um, second philosophy uh, of the day. Um, you know, tomorrow you can dismantle um, St. Paul Cathedral and uh, rebuild a complete, uh, <laughs> a wide, uh, a big housing scheme. Um, stone can be used again and again, um, especially especially if it's in a, in a thick uh, um, if it's th in, a, in, a, in, a, in a thick dimension. You know you can do so much more with a three hundred mil thick stone compared to a thirty mil uh, stone. Um, and um, I, I think there is a, again a strong case of reuse of stone, um, like um, like the Renaissance uh, Nick stone from Gothic uh, churches. And Gothic builders were nicking stone from the Roman uh, amphitheater. So I think you know the the, the stone has got this uh, perpetual uh, use that uh, will be the envy of a lot of the material man-made. So that's it. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Pierre. Um, I think you get the prize for the longest one so far. I'm not sure if you got time for. Um, I mean. No, oh, no, 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 we do. We do. I'm joking. I was joking. <laughs> um, uh, but if you could that. stop sharing um, and okay. then we can. Yes. Um, and then, I mean, if you can get your presentation up while I introduce Hi. you. Um, Amin Taha is the chairman of Group Work, which is known for embracing innovative architectural approaches. Their project 15 Clark and Well Close is well known uh, for receiving a demolition order from Islington Council, who ultimately objected to the load bearing stone facade. So I'm sure you've all read about that. Um, Amin has been quoted as saying, stone is the great forgotten material of our time. In 99% of cases, it's cheaper and greener to use stone in a structural way as opposed to concrete or steel, but we mostly just think of using it for cladding. So over to you, Amin. 
Thank hello, you. Hello. I'll Hi. try. And, I'll, I'll try and stick to the ten minutes. It's fine if you go over. It's fine because uh, <laughs> Steve did as well. <laughs> There's lots of lots of repetition, so I should, should okay. manage it. It's so um, stone. You know, here's the stone staircase that Pierre and Steve already talked about. This one doesn't involve any cables. It's just one stone resting on the other, as we did in medieval all the way Georgian and Victorian period. Uh, any, people can ask questions um, afterwards if they like. Um, and while we were in the stonemason's yard where they were cutting all these steps, we saw these blocks come in and, of course, asked, why can't we build um, uh, um, frames, buildings in stone blocks as opposed to this is the standard way we all do it, isn't it? That we're taught to do it, expected it to be done, and it's still done. And if you add all that together, if you look at the uh, detail on the, um, on the right, you'll see either a steel or concrete frame with waterproofing, fireproofing, uh, uh, insulation, vapor barrier, which ha then has to be penetrated with clamps and then resealed. And then those clamps are fixed to other clamps that are glued uh, uh, or fixed to a veneer. Lots of material, lots of labor, lots of time, and obviously lots of embodied carbon, uh, as opposed to just cut the stone out the quarry. Fairly inexpensive today, fairly easy to do. And some quarries are using um, uh, uh, renewable energy, in which case your the energy that you've used to cut the stone is fairly negligible per, per cubic meter. Various finishes come out, and occasionally if it's a sedimentary rock, you'll get quartz pockets and ammonite shells, which currently are all cut off uh, because people expect, architects expect from the samples that they're given uh, to have pure, nicely cut and, and polished um, finishes. Uh, and our, 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 our um, question was, why not leave it there? It's, it's cheaper to do, less energy is burnt, and that's the natural facing of, of the material itself. So why does that not become the facade? In the same way that we're building for millennia, the structure and architecture are actually one. Uh, the finish is um, the superstructure itself. In this case, the quality of the, um, the quarry cutting, the um, stone masonry and the engineer working on our, on our details. So in that particular instance, as Steve described, you've got a, a concrete core with concrete floor plates, nothing else apart from the stone excess skeleton picking up those floor plates. That's us testing it. And then here on site, as you see shown on temporary props, it being erected until the temporary props come away and the floor plates just sit on that, on that edge. After we finished, we realized, oh, uh, we've also finished three CLT buildings. That CLT went up in eight days. Um, um, why did we put? Why did we use concrete? And of course, CLT is carbon sequestrating. Why not? If we're doing another one, this is on Finchley Road. That's twice the height of Clerkenwell, so ten stories. Why not make all the floor plates of CLT? The challenge here is it's quite a constrained site. Uh, and what we ended up doing is making the stone exoskeleton of stone frame, uh, a sway frame, um, and then the core being independent in between those three different blocks, as it were, CLT, then floor spans. But there is a, there's a longer story to that we can, we can, we can go into later. Basalt is better than limestone in terms of performance in a fire. And again, this is not long after we finished Clerkenwell, so the same philosophy was applying massive stone blocks and beams. Since then, we've all moved on. And this is, you know, this Clerkenwell was conceived 2014, so almost 10 years ago. Um, uh, and this was, uh, this was conceived two years afterwards. Since then, we, we've moved on, as Pierre suggests, into pre-stressing prefabricating your stone beams and columns. This is a 35 story um, scheme in Bristol. That we won in competition, has gone to pre-app and is now Bristol Parks Department just arguing with their housing department who owns the land. And then one day it might actually happen. Um, yeah, just stone blocks stacked on top of one another with an internal courtyard and the rest in timber. And similarly, more pretension stone beams and um, exoskeletons and internal skeletons and reusing some steel that we that's from an existing building that's being demolished on site and the rest in timber. Uh, Canary Wharf asked us to look at a feasibility study for you know their ideal tower that's no more than 30 stories. Is that possible? And uh, we, we found it is possible. And obviously, if there's timber, combined timber floor plates, dowel laminated timber, for instance, 
then the whole building, the whole outcome is carbon sequestrating. Now I'll come to later how you can count a sequestrated carbon. If it's all stone, obviously it's far better than a steel frame or a concrete frame, but the key is, is to mix those materials, make your hybrid structures. We also found that because the stone is doing the talking on the outside, it's doing the facade. You then don't, don't need to buy a very expensive, um, uh, high performance glazing system. It's curtain walling. You can buy something fairly inexpensive, which drops the overall price of, of your tower. So for Canary Wharf, they realized that actually the stone timber hybrid is the cheapest option of them all. And you can see there, it's not an inconsiderable on tower. Well, uh, you know, good, good, good percentage lower. This is the building that Pierre showed you photographs of. Uh, which mixes stacked stone, twin wall stone, uh, stacked stone, pretension beamed, pretension floor plates. There you can see um, what look like medieval arches, series of um, in plan, um, interesting intersecting pre-tensioned uh, arches with stone um, uh, stone um, uh, vaults drop being dropped in in between. There, there you go on the bottom left. The, the examples, the simple stacking, taking out the quarry and just stack it. Couldn't be simpler. Less than the lowest level of energy you used. And, you know, as, uh, as Marcus has pointed out, it'll be there for hundreds of years if it's um, repointed and looked after properly. Uh, on the, you've seen the images on the, on the left before. On the right, there are, there's a, a sort of control area of twin walls stacked. Uh, uh, beams and lintels and floor plates in pretension pre form. And also, if you want to avoid uh, high labor on site, long period on site, you can prefabricate it all in the yard. And the contractors here used um, a basalt uh, cement, which drops their cement level. They're highly interested in reducing labor time. So they opted for this. In the end, we didn't actually use that. We went for just a little bit more labor. To drop the embodied carbon, using waste stone and laminating it here with insulation. So as a as a, as a if you if you curve it, then it becomes structural, obviously. Uh, so there's 10 mil of laminate, lots of insulation, another 10 mil of laminate, and that's so internal external finish and insulation in between. And really, then uh, we get our you know every time we do these presentations, we say oh, we don't want it to look like Clark and Well. Can't we just have a normal building? because they, people associate the material now with Clerkenwell. It's going to look like Clerkenwell. So we decided to do a series of exercises where we take out of building design and AJ every, every week uh, uh, what look like brick or stone buildings, uh, but obviously they're all steel and concrete framed. And let's do a challenge. Let's challenge ourselves to make it look like everybody does. You know, I can mention all the architects that are in BD and AJ every week with 800 homes and so many office buildings so tall and so deep. Let's see whether we can challenge that and come up with the same price, if not less. This is the exoskeleton or the frame, a stone frame that does the equivalent of a, of a concrete frame or a steel frame, but no cladding, no waterproof, no insulation needed. Uh, but you've got a cold bridge detail um, at the facade line. And the facade line is then uh, a glazing system. But again, you drop the price of that glazing system because it's not doing all the hard work in terms of sitting in a conservation area. Um, and then a hybrid of stone bricks, because a lot of a lot of buildings are bricks. And uh, people keep asking us, well, I don't want stone. You know, why, why don't I? In fact, one of the, one of the, answers, the questions we got was um, the, the native British population doesn't understand stone. Uh, this is why somebody uses lots of bricks. They understand bricks. So we said, this is where, you know, we, we came to Marcus about 10 months ago and said, look, got a problem here. People think stone means Clerkenwell. Can you cut stone into brick dimensions? How much is it? It turns out to be the same price as a normal clay fired brick, but obviously the embodied carbon is fractional. It's about 90 odd percent less than a fired clay brick. Guess what? Because it's not being mixed with any other products. It's not being extracted from brick. Takes about six different ingredients to mix together. Bef uh, you know, all these ingredients have to be um, extracted and brought to the factory, mixed up, uh, uh, allowed to dry for 100 degrees C in an oven before they're then fired. Uh, so stone brick is 90 odd percent less than its embodied carbon, but the same damn price. So now you all know that. Ethically, you are duty bound to use stone bricks from now on. Why wouldn't you do anything else? Yeah. 
Um, and of course, they come in any color. Ask Marcus for any color you like. Do not buy fired clay bricks ever again, please, and tell all your friends the same. So uh, there, there are, uh, in the previous examples, uh, exoskeletons that then become the skeleton internally um, as well, if you've got a fairly deep plan as an office or residential. Uh, a hybrid of brick and, um, and um, stone beams there, or a self-supporting facade. So the entire interior might be um, uh, timber, glue lamb, uh, dow laminate timber, CLT, and so on. But of course, the facade over a certain number of stories cannot be timber. The, the elevation can't be. So why not make it a self-supporting facade? Even fired clay bricks can go up six stories without needing any engineering. So that means they're a half brick thick wall stacked on top of another, and it just needs to be tied back with brick ties to the superstructure to stop it falling in the street. So we've built that at Barrett's Grove in fired clay bricks back in 2015. And now, of course, you can do it in stone bricks. Um, so you, you get over all the fire regulations and drop your embodied carbon. Again, these are all just examples of the same theme of how to, how to do that in stone and timber hybrids. And why is that important? Please remember this um, code EN15978. All of you will have sustainability engineers on board in your, in your design teams who give you a black box. Please tell us what your building's made of. Tick, 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 tick on the keyboard. It's Briam OK. It's Briam good. Very good. Oh my God, it's Briam. Excellent, outstanding. Or platinum. Uh, it's exemplar. Um, and you can reach Briam outstanding by, um, by saying, all my timber comes from sustainable um, sources, renewable sources. Does it ask you the percentage of your timber in, in your building? No, it doesn't. All my timber doors, my fire doors or front doors to flats. That's it. The same building can go up. Concrete, steel. You look at it. It's the same building that could have been built um, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but you still can get Briam. So ignore that. Do this instead. EN15978. It, that top line, uh, uh, is the measurement, the globally agreed measurement of embodied carbon across the building's lifespan. So sections A, um, A are, are um, its materials and construction. Section B is operational carbon when it's in use. And section C, what you do on demolition, uh, how much energy you're burning on demolition, what happens to those materials. Now, the, the bottom half, is us then saying, okay, what are those building materials we're using? And uh, you might ask, well, how the hell do I know? You know, the sustainability engineer knows all that. Well, they sort of do, but they don't use it in their black box to to to, to define your Briam excellent and outstanding. So set all that aside. If you go to University of Bath and BSRIA uh, inventory of embodied carbon, every single material you're likely to use is listed in it it's, it's kilograms of carbon per kilogram of material. Problem is, as architects, engineers, or the rest of it, we don't use, we don't work in kilograms of material. We'll use volumes of material, normally cubic meters. So what we did is convert density uh, uh, and uh, mass into volume for each of those materials. And, and that way we could take our BIM model uh, or even just measure with pencil and bit of paper the volume of stone, the volume of timber, the volume of glass, aluminium, you name it, whatever material we've got, the principal materials, because you could get very forensic with it, and, and plug those into our Excel uh, spreadsheet that we created out of, out of uh, EN19578. And that gives you very quickly the embodied carbon of your, your building, your building materials, your building mass. Um, similarly, with the energy in use, we did this with Bureau Hapold. Uh, eight Versa, Web Yates, um, and others. And um, it will give you the embodied carbon of your building. Now, uh, you quickly realize, oh, I've used a lot of steel here. What can I replace? Oh, I can replace some of the steel with stone. I can replace some of the concrete with timber and so on. And before you know it, if you're principally using lots of timber, the building will become carbon negative. So I use sequestered uh, CO2, uh, CO2 into your building and you've locked it in into your building materials. However, 
you cannot count your carbon sequestration unless you promise on demolition your 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 timber will not go into landfill be burnt for fuel well how do we know that most of us will be gone by the time most buildings are demolished so how do we do that uh there are i mean there are other ways of doing it mul multiple ways of doing it in other countries uh, but we're slow in this country to legislate so there is another method and we 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 worked with norton rose fulbright planning barristers to begin to create planning conditions that simply say give me that data of materials from your bim model with the embodied carbon against them and that will go in as a planning condition now so it's effectively a land covenant on that building stating that anything whether you're refurbishing it or coming to demolition you have to get planning approval against every single material what are you going to do with it where's it going is it going to landfill or, or not you are forbidden from taking it to landfill that eventually gives you a list of materials uh, that you can use from sequestrating to to the worst case and as steve was suggesting earlier if you make a traffic light system as if you're going to the supermarket of course you can have some high fat um, salami in your trolley but if your trolley at the till ends up looking all red and yellow you know you're likely to get a heart you know, have a great time for a few years but likely drop dead of a heart attack pretty quickly so you mix it up a bit don't you a bit of green a bit of kale but the kale is going to be very dull isn't it so throw a couple of fried lardons on there and it's delicious and that's that's i think at the end of it that's all we're saying we're not forbidding the use of high embodied carbon materials it's just standing back sensibly looking at the overall combination saying i can manage this with low 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 sequestrating materials principally stone that's what today's talk about talk is about and timber and um and i have a carbon negative building so the building is negative so uh, i i.e the 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 paradigm is um build even more to save the planet yeah and i know i'm being i'm deliberately being provocative here just to to wind people up so they ask the question but why not if we all did that clicked our fingers then why not and you might ask somebody might ask oh, the forests will run out uh well we have professor rummage in cambridge who's saying there's so much forest in Europe already expanding, commercial forestry expanding, literally the forest is just getting bigger and bigger, that soon we'll be sequestering about 25% of Europe's um, emissions. And Professor Rummage in, in Zurich saying there's actually so many billion hectares of unused cleared land, not used for agriculture, pasture or development, that if that was allowed to go to bio, bio, biodiverse forestry within 100 years, we'd be at pre-industrial levels of atmospheric CO2. You overlay and combine both those uh, bits of research, you can say, right, I'm, I'm using about 16% of that biodiverse forestry for construction industry. You'll accelerate, accelerate that 100 years to about 70 years. And at that point, I'll stop. Thanks. That's great. Um, I was thinking about um, it, you suggesting the uh, the kale is boring and we're not or pro proposing vegan architecture in some sort of way. <laughs> Yeah. Quite yeah. Fun. Um, right, we've got loads of questions that we've been gathering. Is yeah. it bad echo? echo? No, just get on. Okay, right. Right, right. So we'll, we'll go, go to, to uh, Wabi. Wabi. So, so Wabi, Wabi was asking Marcus, what, um, where, where is the source of all the stone and, this is, and what the environmental impact is on the places that the stone is mined? And secondly, do you use a specific known type or, or can all stones be used for construction? Okay, so actually, I think. Uh, I mean, has got a really great answer to this, but in essence, um, we are digging minerals mm -hmm. for every single man-made construction product. So that's no different than digging stone, except that we burn a lot less energy producing them. And we are constantly regenerating stone uh, from, from magma as its center right out to to the extremities of it we literally i think i think actually steve you create you um you gave some some notes on it that there is just an enormous amount if everybody used stone i think you said it was something like about 45 two, i don't know two, i can't remember i think we just said I think well, we, I think we to keep it short out, we, uh, we it was just, like two just, two ben nevises that's it if the whole planet yeah, used stone, a short mountain. I don't think anyone would miss it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so exactly I mean, it, that. And the other thing quickly to say is that I think somebody was asking the question about, um, you know, the strength of stone. Can all stones be used? As long as you understand the cons the compressive strength, you know, the the mineral mineralogy and the makeup of the stone, you then design accordingly with that stone. So whatever its flexural strength is, whatever its porosity is, you design. Steve has a field day using those numbers to to design appropriately. OK, maybe I'll take over. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. That was a question that was mine, actually. I was wondering what happened to the sawdust in the factory when you, well, the stone sawdust, when you grind the stone and cut the stone. So, so within that process, all of that material is pressed out of the water. In, in, in our particular uh, yard, we use um, about 450 pounds worth of water a year because we recycle it. And then the um, the base product, the, the the sediment product for that, is often used to boat uh, in in um, roads and floor structures uh, as a bulk product, pro uh, sort of a bulking agent. Okay, right, thanks. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, one go thing. On, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, the the thing is, uh, the more byproducts you have. You have more byproducts, stone dust, and so on, if you do a lot of cuts. Okay, so if in a block of stone you just do 300 mil thick stone wall instead of 30 mil slabs, you are going to generate, generate a lot less uh, stone dust and byproduct. So, again, the, the less cut you do, the less uh, stone dust you need to get rid of and, and find a, an outlet for this, uh, for this byproduct. Um, so I think it's just something that uh, I just wanted to uh, yeah. Yeah. to to comment. Sure, that actually makes sense. Thanks for adding that. Um, we might just be jumping around a bit. I've got a question from Rahul asking about the stone in uh, seismic regions and how that behaves. Um, maybe one for Steve. Steve, or? yeah, yeah. Um, so we have designed post-tension stone um, stairs in Turkey and San Francisco uh, in seismic regions, and we um, uh, have added additional. So what you're concerned about is the, the joints um, uh, taking damage and spalling. And so we, we put uh, additional links and confinement reinforcement in the joints of the stone, uh, and we were able to make it work by an analysis. But clearly... Um, I mean, as I said, we've, we've done very limited R&D. There's no kind of formal international R&D program. And, you know, the studies, you know, um, people spend billions and billions of dollars and pounds uh, investigating concrete and earthquake structures all over the world. Um, and, um, and that level of research hasn't happened for stone. Um, and different stone, we use the word stone generically, but clearly they're chemically and physically very different to each mm -hmm. other. So granites and uh, very high strength stones are very brittle and suffer from glass-like fracture mechanic problems, whereas uh, softer limestones are more um, effectively more ductile. Um, but we, um, there's a long road to go in really understanding or developing uh, the, the technical uh, the basis for a lot of stone design and uh, well the other irony was that the um um the british standards agency apparently told somebody that um they'll only make codes for for materials where there's a demand which means that they're going to make codes for concrete and steel in perpetuity and no codification will bring into being a new material which is a major obstacle to the use of stone not having so, code sort of code. an advantage because stone has been around for millennia so it doesn't it didn't need a code doesn't need a code uh, but joking aside uh, all that pretensioned um, stone beam uh, and column idea where the whole frame is a pretension prefabricated set of stone beams and columns that all come together so if they're coming together in all those dimensions they're not all coming together to a stone joint you effectively got the equivalent of a bucky joint which will be steel and that is then taking any any movement so it's the steel doing the job so you have to remember this this is what we're sort of concluding with it's not a, the idea of eliminating 
all steel and concrete. It's simply saying if you stand back, the amount of energy used to make um, a steel beam and a uh, steel column, the amount of energy used to make a concrete frame with steel and reinforcement in it, if you stand back and say, can I replace almost all of it with just stone? In most cases, you can. Uh, but as you get bigger buildings, more complex buildings, and especially in seismic area, let's reintroduce some steel. But the steel is so minimal by comparison with a steel beam or reinforcement. It, it, overall, if you're still using timber in lots of the floor plates and other areas, you're still a carbon negative um, outcome. So uh, certainly Finchley, because it has to take wind loading and act as a, as a sway frame, it's one of the first ones where we're experimenting with cross bracing in that grid. So there's a load of diagonals, and that's Webb Yates's job, um, Steve's job, where that then is allowed to sway, and those diagonals are helping to brace the building as opposed to a central core. So there will be solutions. Um, it's just, it's just. There are um, there are lots of stone, very old stone buildings in um, earthquake zones. Most obviously, the Parthenon. Um, and um, they used, I think I'm right in saying that they used um, lamb's wool joints in the bottom of the columns to allow them to rock, or they cut a dome into the stone so that the joints can articulate without breaking. Um, and um, those sorts of techniques, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's something called a Persian arch, which is effectively um, um, a keystone, keystone arch, but it's been given um, a rounded edges to those stones so they're allowed to move in that keystone without the arch then collapsing dropping out they've interlocked it effectively right thank you um that's for interesting answers and i'm sure there's quite a lot to be found in historic buildings as well that's still up million years later oh. um i've got a question from andrea who is asking um if uh, the post tensioning holes are grouted or is it unbonded? And if it's the latter, how do you deal with the cable corrosion? Uh, yeah, we, so, uh, we bond it. so oh, yeah, sorry, you wanted to go, it, to go oh, for it, Steve? Go um, uh, so we we bond, uh, so we, we inject a cementitious, cementitious grout in the hole around the, uh, around the rebar. Um, so to uh, to stop any, 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 any few, I mean, to stop at least slow, let's say uh, on the long term, uh, to the, the corrosion, um, you um, you can uh, you can use um, galvanized um, galvanized cables, uh, metal cable um, instead of uh, um, instead of un, um, untreated uh, steel. Um, uh, some people use stainless steel, um, but on the on the DV deck that we used, uh, we usually just uh, grout uh, with cementitious grout, um, and yes, um, so it's bonded. I mean, li um, limestone is alkaline anyway, and so gives a degree of protection to the steel. The steel only corrodes in an acidic environment, but granites and basalts, I believe, are um, have a lower than seven pH. Um, so you depend more on the grouting in a, in a material like that. But again, oh, no. this is the kind of stuff that needs to be studied. But, uh, yeah, follow-up question. Can you actually change the cables? Uh, so... Uh... You, you want to go for it? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, so if, if it's unbonded um, and if what we called a uh, grease and sleeve um, uh, cable, you can't change it. So um, effectively, you can change it if it's unbonded. Uh, if it's bonded, um, you, you, can, you cannot change it. Okay. Um, so... Uh, Another question runs in the same line. It's a question from Warren, Ron, who is asking what's the expected life, uh, lifespan of a pre post tension uh, stone structures. Then, do we have an idea? Not yet. People are obsessed with the pre tensioned. I mean, just a, I mean, I hope anybody asking about pre tensioned is because they're doing giant concrete frame or steel frame buildings. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that most of what we build around the planet, let alone what we build in, in the UK, is under, is six stories and under, isn't it? So yeah, you know, in London you'll you'll walk around you'll see buildings of three stories, four stories, five stories, six stories, seven stories in concrete frames. And the message we're trying to get out at the moment is, don't do a concrete frame. You don't even need a pretension frame for those buildings. 
you can do those in timber and uh, and stone and meet fire regs stone self-supporting facade yeah it's only when you get taller then you get into um uh, you know it makes more sense it no longer makes sense to have a timber frame structure going seven eight nine ten and then whatever it is 30 even stories in, um, i mean thinking about for example the google building which is not that tall but yeah that's right yeah, massive yeah. i mean yeah. um there yeah, if you want to if you want to do structural gymnastics where you've got cantilevers and all the rest of it uh, that timber's just going to work too hard a, a seven meter span in a timber building is a challenge yeah. um, because of vibration yeah. and would normally uh unveil quite a deep um beam section which pushes the building height up stone post tension stone beams are much stronger and stiffer than timber beams so it's yeah. primary frame yeah, yeah. Uh, post tension stone is quite a good idea externally yeah of durability that's also mm. true so i think the, the yeah. kind of having in our arsenal oh yeah absolutely uh, absolutely and uh, and clt yeah. and joists yeah. and yeah. you know different yeah. combinations of materials I, I don't want to put pierre out of business or um or, <laughs> no, I uh, sorry i don't want to limit um, pierre's um pretension uh, frame um, no i i think it, oh. it, it, the, the thing is that we are going to come back to the same problem anyway yeah. the thing yeah. is if if you need to unset and set traditionally your stone you yeah. are going to make it more expensive. The, yeah. the post the, the, the post tensioning uh, the mm. post tensioning is about pre pretensioning pretensioning pretension. No, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. Pretensioning. Um, yeah. yeah. it, it's about pre-assembling uh, pre-assembling your uh, your elements yeah, uh, yeah. so that it yeah. goes faster on site. Um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a, it's not about just putting the stone on steroid. It, it's also no, no. about oh, no. simplifying the the system and on site. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and as for longevity, yeah. as as uh, as Steve, uh, I mean, uh, or, I mean, I said, you know, there is so many concrete structure that has yeah. been for the last hundred years uh, pre pre um, pre tension, uh, post tension, and yeah. you know we've survived well. And also, and also, you can go in uh, to Portuguese house in central London and see some of the um, some of the work by done by Michael Hopkins and Bureau Era. Yeah. Uh, on on post tensioning as well as the Emmanuel yeah. College Library, um, or or the Saint Charles yeah. uh, Saint Charles in Paris, in, um, in in Marseille, yeah. the, all, all that has been aged beautifully. I, I think it's probably worth noting that steel is an amazing material. I mean, it really is. It's a fantastic building material. It's so strong and it's so compact and it's so yeah. easy to form. As for an engineer. Designing with steel is so easy, you know, and so yeah. powerful, you know, yeah. that it's very, very seductive. And if it wasn't for the carbon thing, you'd say, yeah, make everything out, out of steel. Oh, so, that's right. yeah. um, so we do, and timber is is much more challenging in that respect because it's not very strong and it's not very stiff. And so mm. I think post-tension stone puts something in the hands of builders that can deal with situations where timber yeah. is really not cutting. Well, out. I mean, uh, the, the, you know, uh, we work on on um, on um, uh, you know we're not Taylor Wimpy. Yeah, uh, most of this country is being built at that sort of scale by those sort of people, not by by us who are doing nice projects, uh, occasional projects, uh, special projects, and and probably most of our viewers, listeners are doing that sort of stuff. But a lot of the country is being built by um, you know low scale. Uh, doesn't have the sort of attention that w that we give it, and really, um, my my, you know, what I what I'd like people to take away from is absolutely there is a pretension stone frame solution which can have timber and more stone uh, hybrid, and the outcome can be carbon negative, and it can have stone bricks as self-supporting facade as well, and those going to be those will be beautiful buildings. Um, but the rest, we need to persuade everybody else. You know, I come across um, uh, passive house people who who are absolutely um, committed to the passive house solution, and and uh, I'm scratching my head thinking, but you've got a house which is ground plus one as a steel frame, and then you're suspending, you're you're driving up a, a clay fired brick um, uh, wall, and some of it's being held up with shelf angles. Uh, 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 the overall embodied carbon. Which, if you measure it, fifty-seven percent of the embodied carbon of a material of a house or or a building over its lifespan is the materials and its construction. So you've given no thought to those materials. And what we need to get across today is, stone can replace that fired clay brick and drop it by ninety odd percent. You hybrid that with timber, and then the 
the passive house solution is carbon negative, that passive house solution is ground plus one, ground plus two, three, four, five, six stories. Um, and it will be carbon negative in its outcome. And yes, where, you, where you're special, like us lot, where we are lucky enough to get brief uh, special stone pre-stressed, um, uh, prefabricated assembly that's quick to assemble on site with more timber and all the rest of it. Um, so it's not a debate of either or, it's just we need to just create a, a tsunami of, of um, ethical solutions that where people don't have a choice. It's the same bloody price as a brick, but the embodied carbon is a fraction. Your superstructure for anything low, lower than six stories and lower ought to be timber or stone hybrid. Again, same price and ethical solution. As long as people go away, go away with that, I think we've done our job. And yes, well, um, the one thing we didn't mention with the, the, the stone bricks, um, clay bricks are a nightmare because of expansion because of moisture expansion, requiring ugly mastic joints and shelf angles all over buildings, every second floor, every single yeah. floor, every yeah. six meters. Yeah. Stone doesn't do that. Yeah. And yeah. it's much stronger. So not only is stone um, lower carbon, it also requires much less fiddly, faffy detailing. Yeah. No a... shelf angles. If it's a self-supporting wall, that's what it should be. Six ground plus five. With no special engineering, that's a half brick wall. Yeah. And we've done a clay fire brick solution as well, but let's just opt for the stone brick solution. No shelf angles, no weep holes, no expansion joints. You've got rid of materials and time on site. Um, and then if your timber is, let's say, it's CLT or DLT, it's self finished, there's no aluminium partitioning and battening and plasterboard and skim coat and paint and all the rest of it suddenly you've lost those materials, that labor and time on site. And what our clients have found is they can't resist that, despite the fact that the agents are telling them no one will live or buy uh, a um, Swedish sauna interior because it's all bloody timber. Uh, when you tell the client you've saved about 20%, 25% of your construction costs because you've saved material, labor, and time, the clients will say, you know what, I'm taking a gamble. I'm doing it. If I can't sell anything in the first first month, I'm sending the team in there to paint everything white. Yeah, and of course, surprise, surprise. I mean, London, I suppose, is in particular. There must be enough Swedes around because all those flats end up selling for 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 more than the than the ones with conventional white painted plasterboard. So uh, yeah, I mean, you know, okay. these are sort of obvious solutions, but we're, we're hopefully that's the takeaway from from today. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think we might just have time for one more question. But before, just on a side note, regarding passive house and natural materials, we have a recording on our YouTube channel about that. We did an event about 18 months ago. So go on our channel and have a look. Someone might post it in the chat now, actually. Um, maybe one last question going um, more into the recycling stone. Got an interesting question from Tim, who is asking you that if you're repurposing old stone, maybe an old granite lintel, um, is there a possibility of there being like hidden internal defects that would reduce the, the properties of that uh, material? And how do you get around this? How do you find out? You might note that if it's performed perfectly well in its situation for a couple of hundred years or whatever it's performed the suggestion would be no that it hasn't got failures if you continue to use it under the same load requirements um and i don't know ask steve the rest steve? um we need to we need to assess uh stone for uh the strength that it has and that's one of the challenges in using stone that you need when you take it out from the quarry you need to do a lot of testing and it's difficult to work out how strong it is and um because of the uh unpredictability of that we have very high facts of safety when we design with stone and somebody with a better brain than mine will figure out how to um how to grade stone um i think you we are reusing uh we're quite often reusing stone as a post-tensioned element because it's um uh the compression strength of stone is very very high and uh far less of a concern and fractures are not opening up they're compressing um when we're using the tensile strength of stone that's the um 
uh, slightly more frightening thing. But I think if you found a granite lintel in an old building and you wanted to reuse it, you would probably just load it and see how strong, uh, see if it's strong enough to do what you wanted it to do. I think that would be the safest, um, the safest way. I don't, stone doesn't really, um, I mean, potentially it gets weather damage with freeze thaw, but within a building, it should be reasonably inert. Um, so we're, we're doing with Pierre at the moment, we're doing a, a Victorian um, mansion house burned down and the stones are strewn all over the site. And we're putting them back together again in Pierre's uh, workshop, re or stressing them and turning them into beams, which is kind of really um, slightly, uh, resulting in some slightly bizarre beams. But um, uh, but yeah, you can totally reuse it. But there's a whole, I mean, yeah, we. If there's a future for stone, there is a much more sophisticated way of understanding cataloging and maybe passporting its strength for reuse and, mm. and all kinds of things that. Um, so uh, more research. There, more, there are more, sonic. More there are, there are um, sort of uh, developments in sonic testing uh, of natural stone as well. We did so, yeah, we tried that and we, we we ultrasound tested a load of stone and then we tested the strength of all the stone and we found no correlation at all, which was um, frustrating. But I don't, we, we don't, I don't understand the chemistry or the crystalline structure of stone particularly well and the distinctions between different stones and what causes it to be strong or weak or where the flaws are or um, I think, um, you know, it needs somebody far more intelligent than We've gone quite a long way with very little R and D and very little codification, what? and I think it's really quite an amazing achievement to have built what we've built without um, a, a codification framework. But you know, the knowledge of stone as a modern material compared to concrete and steel is infinitesimal, and really needs I, a more material science. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. 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 Just. Um... Just on that, I, I think uh, what is fascinating is how, I mean, fascinating in a, in, unfortunately, in a sad way, is how, um, how nearly 6,000 years of working with stone has been reduced to nothing in the Western world, huh? in the Western world, has been reduced to nothing with two, two world war. Okay, we do not think enough of how many people died in trenches on the first world and the second world war and all the knowledge that disappeared with all these craftsmen and how suddenly you had as stone disappeared you had concrete coming up, uh, up on top we still manufacture we, we still use and so on and, and i think we we just witness how a, 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 a craftsman a craftsmanship knowledge of a material can disappear in a space of 50 years because us stone mason have been completely inhibited in in in, in 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 the way we are using our material now as a structural material you know we can put as many flooring as you want cladding as you want but specifying a lintel for a small house around the corner we can't and that is a sad sad truth and um but i think there is a lot of people around uh, all around the world which are fascinated about the the, the use of stone and how to to, to put it back into a uh, uh, into the new build yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Just there's one last question, but I'm going to answer it myself. Someone's asking about stone in foundations. And I'm just going to say that our last talk was about foundations and natural foundations. So Steph just put the link to the if recording you, into the if, chat. Yeah, if you, um, I mean, if, no, if anybody's interested, Pierre and Steve have devised stone foundations and stone basements. And we tested that with um, two waterproofing companies. And they effectively said, look, it's just like building concrete block basements. As long as your, your outside wall is no longer, no bigger than five, plus or minus five mil, our waterproofing, two layers of waterproofing can go on the outside. That's our warranty done for, for material and installation. You can put your insulation on the outside of that. Obviously in urban conditions, if you've got site constraints, working constraints would be different. But it shows that you can even go into basements and not have to concrete everything. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, right. I think if I don't think we've got time for much more than that, I'm going to hand over to Anna for um, a little wrap up if the echo is gone.
Shall we turn uh, has my has it gone? Yes. It's, it's gone. It's perfect. Thank it you very much. It was fine before we open the doors for everyone, isn't that interesting? Okay, so thanks Thank a lot for taking over. Um, uh, and thanks to the speakers for a really good conversation. And thanks to everybody for coming tonight. Um, um, it's been a good it's been a good evening and a pleasure to see so many people here.